What blood work do you need in order to determine if your hormones are out of balance? After 30 years of treating hormonally challenged patients, this is the blood work I like to look at to determine if hormones are out of balance. A comprehensive metabolic panel, lipid panel, CBC, hemoglobin A1C, C-peptide, prolactin, DHEA sulfate, TSH, free T4, free T3, IGF-1, FSH, and LH. I rarely look at individual sex hormones because looking at estrogen and progesterone and testosterone levels in a woman, especially in her reproductive years, is futile. Unless you're checking her every single day of her cycle, you're not going to get adequate measurements. Now, there are a few days of the cycle that will give you some peak measurements, like checking progesterone seven days before her period, can determine if she's ovulated and produced enough progesterone to maintain a pregnancy. But the more accurate test for sex hormones is actually looking at the pituitary hormones. Measuring pituitary FSH and LH shows if you're making optimal levels of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone for you. FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone, which reflects how much estrogen you're producing. And LH or luteinizing hormone reflects progesterone production in women and testosterone production in men. FSH is elevated when you're going through perimenopause and menopause because your estrogen levels are low. Your pituitary gland is a better barometer of your normal hormone levels. Individual blood levels are compared to norms, which are the average level for other people your age and gender. But people's hormones have been declining. 20 years ago, testosterone levels were almost double what they are today. So just because you're in range with everyone else does not mean those levels are optimal for you. And since we don't usually check your hormones when you're young and healthy and you're feeling great, we don't have a basis of comparison for you but your pituitary gland knows what's optimal for you. Your symptoms can be more reflective of your hormones than lab tests. But that being said, I have found that if I look at certain blood levels at certain times of the day and certain times of the month in menstruating women, then I am able to determine an endocrine function or hormone function. So let's continue with thyroid hormone imbalance. Typically only TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone is measured. TSH is produced by your pituitary gland in response to your circulating thyroid hormone, both T4 and T3. Like all endocrine hormones, it's your hypothalamus that reads the circulating hormones and then tells your pituitary gland to make more or less of the stimulating hormone for that gland. So if T4 and T3 levels are too low for you, your hypothalamus will tell the pituitary gland to make more TSH, which stimulates your thyroid to make more T4, which gets converted into the active form, T3. If you're only measuring TSH, you're not getting the full picture of thyroid function. You need to measure free T4 and free T3 to know what's really going on with thyroid function because only free unbound thyroid hormone affects cell activity. If autoimmunity is suspected, then I also measure anti-thyroid antibodies like TPO. So what about your adrenals? Well, I measure DHEA sulfate to determine basic adrenal function. I almost never measure cortisol levels. And that's because you have to have Addison's disease to see a really super low cortisol level. Even if you've had adrenal fatigue and are not making much cortisol, you usually have enough reserve to spike cortisol for a blood test. So it rarely shows your true adrenal function. DHEA, on the other hand, follows cortisol production and the sulfated version lasts a long time. So measuring DHEA sulfate gives you a window into your adrenal function. If I suspect my patient has severe adrenal fatigue, I'll also measure pregnenolone and unconjugated DHEA to check their adrenal reserve. Prolactin is another hormone that I look at, which is usually ignored by most healthcare providers. Prolactin is produced by the pituitary gland in a circadian fashion, high at night and low during the day. Pregnant and lactating women make the most prolactin, but we make prolactin because it helps regulate our immune system. High daytime prolactin levels can block hormone receptor sites. So I usually measure prolactin between 8 and 9 a.m., which should be under 10. If it's higher than that, you still have too much prolactin on board from the nighttime. 
And you'll probably notice that you're not waking up very perky because prolactin keeps you in a kind of sedated state so your immune system can do its job at night. Daytime prolactin tends to be high in people who are overweight or have an autoimmune condition. Then I look at human growth hormone activity by measuring IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor. IGF-1 is the mediator for human growth hormone. Human growth hormone is produced by the pituitary gland and has a very short half-life, and so it must be continually measured to get an accurate reading. HGH levels are naturally lower as we age, but if it's too low, we have trouble healing. IGF-1 can be falsely elevated if you're diabetic with super high blood sugars. I include a comprehensive metabolic panel on my hormone workup to be sure my patient's kidneys and livers are functioning normally. A lot of my patients come in taking lots of different supplements and certain herbs, especially some Chinese herbs, can actually cause some kidney issues. Now sometimes they're taking so many supplements and so many medications that they're having some liver problems. So I need to know their basic metabolic function because I really don't want to give them more stuff before helping them detox. I also get a lipid panel because steroid hormones are made from cholesterol. Steroid hormones include your sex hormones and adrenal hormones. Your total cholesterol and your LDL will be elevated when you're not making enough sex hormones or adrenal hormones. I don't just do a basic lipid panel though. I measure subparticle sizes of LDL and HDL. I'm looking for large buoyant particles. The bigger the particle, the better. Big, large, buoyant HDL and LDL are protective and will not cause arteriosclerosis. So if the total cholesterol is high, but it's mostly made up of large particles, I'm not worried about the patient having heart disease. I'm concerned that they're not producing enough steroid hormones. I also do a CBC, a complete blood count, to make sure there's no sign of anemia or bone marrow deficiencies. I wanna make sure that my patient does not have any underlying disorders that may be contributing to their symptoms or caused by their hormonal imbalances. I also want to check their glucose metabolism by measuring C-peptide and hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C is a protein molecule on the red blood cell that reflects how much blood sugar you've had floating around in your bloodstream for the last six to eight weeks or about the lifespan of a red blood cell. A more immediate measurement of insulin production is C-peptide. C-peptide is the protein molecule that insulin is bound to when it's released by the pancreas. Insulin will immediately bind to circulating glucose, so C-peptide is pretty consistent measurement of pancreatic function. If C-peptide is extremely low, you're not making enough insulin, which is typical in an insulin-dependent type 1 diabetic. If C-peptide is high, over four, you're making too much insulin, which reflects insulin resistance at the cellular level and is a sign of type two diabetes. The triad of adrenal DHEA sulfate, thyroid hormones, and C-peptide or hemoglobin A1C gives me information about whether or not the hypothalamus is out of balance. And that's really key to this whole picture because the hypothalamus is controlling all of these endocrine hormones but we can't measure the hormones from the hypothalamus. So I need to look at the function of the lower glands controlled by the hypothalamus to determine whether or not there is miscommunication with the hypothalamic pituitary endocrine gland axis or not. For instance, if your free T4 and free T3 levels are low, but so is your TSH, then you have a hypothalamic pituitary thyroid miscommunication. Now I know this is a lot of complicated information, why don't you sign up for my free hormone reboot training where you'll get access to the same education I give my patients to help them interpret their results. So are there other tests that could measure hormones? When I first began studying neuroimmune endocrinology, I played around with lots of other different laboratory tests to determine what would really confirm or deny what I was seeing in my patients. I did 24-hour urine tests and salivary tests and blood tests. Now urine reveals hormone metabolites and saliva can indicate hormones at a tissue level. Blood reveals what hormones are available in the body. 
None of these tests truly tell us exactly what's going on with your hormones. That's why it's more important to assess the signs and symptoms of hormonal imbalance and use the lab test to confirm. I'll see you in the next video.